so good to have you with us today, partaking of the Lord's Supper. Um, it's so important that we have a, a time of communing with the Lord. And we, we here in the tabernacle have just uh, taken our communion elements, remembering the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave uh, for all of mankind. Today is July 4th, the 4th of July. Uh, and we happen to be in the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Yeah. You know, when I was little, I, I would say to my mom, oh, wow, 4th of July is coming up. Um, and I know you weren't born here. Did they have a 4th of July in England? And she would say, no. I said, what, did you skip from the 3rd to the 5th? <laughs> I'd catch her every year. <laughs> but we thank God the 4th of July is when the Declaration of Independence was ratified uh, by the 52 signature on that uh, declaration and was sent off to King George saying we're no longer under your rule but we are now an independent nation. And so I just want to talk a little bit uh, as I normally do around the 4th of July about the uniqueness of America. And so I came up with this great title for uh, today's talk, and it's entitled, The Uniqueness of America. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and so uh, for those of you that weren't here, I, 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 this is for those of you that are watching later uh, by way of YouTube. I we just read a portion of scripture talking about the communion. And I did that purposely because uh, I have a lot of quotes from our founding fathers, but uh, not a lot from the Word of God, so that you know that I'm not a heretic. I still believe in the Word of God, uh, but I want you to know our country was founded on godly principles because they are not telling you that today, both in the schools, both on TV, uh, wherever you go, they want you to believe that our founders were heathens and, mm -hmm. and, and didn't believe in God, and, and all they wanted to do was make more money and, and, and kill slaves and, and all this kind of thing. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about our founding fathers. Uh, the Bible says that all individuals, everyone, has sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're a human being on the planet Earth, you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only person that has not sinned and come short of God's glory is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And so, remembering that, our uh, founding fathers are a group of individuals who have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Uh, but there were different ones. There were some that were like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul greatly loved God and he greatly loved this country. And he went out to do everything he could do every minute of every day. He was all about, you know, fulfilling God's plan and purpose in the earth. And some of our founding fathers were like that. But others were like David who greatly loved God and they loved their country, but they sinned. They did wrong things, like, like David. You know, good, good generally, but they messed up. But then there's others who are like Samson, who loved God and he loved this country, but you know, he seemed to goof up all the time. But somehow, God still used him. And so some of our founding fathers are like Samson. They, they, they love God and they love their country, uh, uh, but you know, they, they didn't live the best of lives but God still used them to bring or, uh, about this nation. So in September 1774, here in Philadelphia, we had the first Continental Congress where we had 40 uh, representatives from the 13 uh, original colonies come together. Uh, some say that 13 is a bad number, but I always think about how uh, Jesus and his disciples sitting around made up 13 people. Amen. And it, it was like this. The 13 colonies were like Jesus and disciples coming together to discuss the future of the colonies. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Some of them didn't like each other. Most of them didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. Folks lived up in Maine, didn't necessarily know the people down in Georgia or, or the various states. But they all came together in Philadelphia and they said, listen, we don't know what to do. We we're frustrated, we don't like what Britain is doing to us, so I want to propose this is how we start. Let's pray. The very first thing they said, we, don't, we all come from different backgrounds, we all have different ideas, 
We all, we all are frustrated and, and it could easily uh, be at each other's throat in a minute because uh, of all that's going on in our country. But we need to seek the face of God to come to a common mind, something that we can unite around. And they spent the first two hours of that meeting praying and crying out to God. Then after that, what did they do? Did they start drawing up walls and making that much? No. They said, let's open our Bibles and see what God would say to us. We've told God our issues, our problems, what's going on in this, these colonies, how, how we're, you know, how should we come together? Should we even try to dare to go against England? Now let's open our Bibles and see what God has to say. And some, for some reason, they turn to Psalms 35. I'm not going to read Psalms 35, but that's your homework this week for the 4th of July homework. Psalms 35. And they were blown away. John Adams, after the meeting, he wrote to his wife, Abigail. This is what he said. I must beg you to read that psalm. Read Psalms 35 to your friends. Read Psalms 35 to your father. God has given us the confidence that we would defeat Britain. God has also laid it upon our hearts to call the colonies to a time of prayer and fasting. Millions will be upon their knees at once before the great creator, imploring his forgiveness and blessings, his smiles on American councils and arms. Wow. That's what John Adams, after meeting in Congress, wrote to his wife. Wow is right. How many congressmen? congressmen come home and after a session in Congress, write that to their wife. During this time of the revolution, this was in 1774, two years before our declaration, there were 15 calls for all of the colonies to set aside either a day of fasting and prayer or a day of thanksgiving. They would have a day of fasting and prayer, and God would do some miraculous thing, and then they said, wow, we have to have a day of thanksgiving. And then they would celebrate the, what God had done for them. I have a few examples. Oh, one other fact, or, or, or piece of trivia you might want to uh, This was so amazing to the people of that day to see God's hand in their life when they fasted and prayed that there were 1,400, 1,400 such days declared by 1815. I mean, the, 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 the colonies saw how it worked when the men, when the colonies came together and declared it over all of the colonies. So the governors of the, of the colonies of that time said, let's see if it will work in our colonies. And governors began to declare days of fasting and praying. And when God moved in their situation, uh, then they would declare days of thanksgiving. Here's an example. John Hancock was the uh, governor of Massachusetts at the time. And during his term as governor, he called for 22 days of fasting and prayer. I'm going to read a couple of his declarations and see if it sounds like any of the declarations our governors are making today. Pray that the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be established in peace and righteousness among all the nations of the earth. Another declaration he wrote, pray that all nations may bow to the scepter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that the whole earth may be filled with his glory. Another declaration he wrote, pray and confess our sins before God and implore his forgiveness through the merits of of meditation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is John Hancock, you know, the one uh, signature you can read on the Declaration of Independence. He was so bold and brash about his relationship with God. He said, I want to make sure King George sees that he's not the king of the universe. And he made these declarations as governor. He said, I want all the citizens of the state. Can you imagine a governor writing that? Can you imagine the governor of Massachusetts writing that? God, we've come a long way. And I'm not so sure. Well, I am so sure it is not the right way. Jesus. Now, you don't dare say Jesus unless it's followed by a four-letter word. John Adams again wrote to his wife, he said, his wife Abigail, he said, God's hand of providence can be seen. And then he began to give examples. 
He said, Colonel Smith and his men captured a British fort. All of you say, big deal. Well, this is even before the war officially broke out. There was no army. So when the Continental Congress came and decided, he said, well, put out a decree to all the colonies. He said, any man who can get 20 of his neighbors together, we'll make him a colonel in our army. And so it says, Colonel Smith was just Mr. Smith. He went to his neighbors. You want to join me? Can you get your rifle and come with me? We're going to take over this British fort. Now, the British were the most powerful army in the entire world. What made them so powerful was they had the biggest, best, uh, boldest navy. So they controlled all the seas of the world, literally. And so it was crazy. It was crazy. It would be like uh, the, the, the nation of Laos coming and attacking America and saying, we're going to take over the United States. Laos, what's that? It's a little country. It's like, it's like Grenada coming and saying, we're going to invade Florida and take over Florida. Well, this is what happened. Mr. Smith, he went up against a, a British fortress and took it over. That was God's hand at work. And, and John Adams goes on to write his wife. He said, uh, we took over a 64 cannon British man of war. It's the biggest battleship of the day, most powerful. It would be the equivalent, I don't know, of an aircraft carrier that can hold 5,000 men of our, in our day. This was the biggest, baddest thing that man has made on the water in that day. 64 cannons, 32 on each side. These colonists took it over. They didn't even have a navy. They had one rowboat with a cannon strapped in the front and a cannon strapped in the back. That was the providence of God. That was the providence of God that these few farmers, these few furniture makers, these few lawyers or teachers or whatever they were, housewives, whatever they were, these few people with very little education came together and defeated the greatest army in the world. Why? Because they prayed, they cried out to God. Because they had men and women in leadership who knew God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. I beg to differ that, with those that say that we are not a Christian nation. In a Christian nation, we do not force you to become a Christian. Unlike the Muslim nations or other nations with, with state religions. There was a man by the name of Charles Carroll who signed the Declaration of Independence. He became a senator from the state of Massachusetts. He was the longest survivor of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He finally passed some 56 years after he signed the document, well into the 50, uh, uh, 1800s. And he said, nearing his death, he was in his 90s, he lived actually three times longer than the average day, average person of his day. And he said, I am glad to see the United States carry on the tradition of the two greatest holidays in our country. Number one being Chris Christmas, and number two being the 4th of July. He said, these are the greatest religious holidays in our nation. Why did he say that? Because he saw the two very similarly. He said, Christmas, we celebrate God sending Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom so that we would not be under the rule of Satan. We will not be subject to the law of sin. That's why we celebrate Christmas, number one, because God sent his son into the earth. But 4th of July, number two? I thought the second greatest holiday was Halloween. Ill. <laughs> yeah, ill is right. <laughs> but, but it has become that. Yeah. But no, in his day, in the 18, I forget when he, he passed, the 1830s or 40s, he said, 4th of July has become the greatest 
second greatest holiday in our nation, and I hope it continues. I pray that it continues because he saw that, that the 4th of July was the birthing of a nation or a kingdom that freed man from the tyranny of other men, from tyrannical rule in the earth. We were unique in the earth in that we did not have people subject to the dictates of the king. You looked at the king the wrong way, off with your head. I don't have enough money in my pocket, up go your taxes. Your wife is looking pretty good to me, I think she'll be mine. But in this country, the king didn't have the last say. We started out our constitution with we the people. We the people who have been empowered by our creator. And the, the founding father said, you can call the creator whoever you want to be, but somebody created us Amen. that's bigger than us, a big supernatural being. Our creator, they call him the God of nature, whatever you want to name him. He said he created us and empowered us with unalienable rights, rights that cannot be removed or separated from us to establish a government. The government was not set up to rule over us. The people are established here in this country to establish the government. Yes. Benjamin Franklin said, we will have the government that we deserve. Mm -hmm. You don't like the government, what they're doing? Who put them in? We the people. John Adams wrote, our constitution. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Say, so, well, this only works. The government that we've laid out only works if the people are moral. So also in that Constitutional Congress, they decided that they would print Bibles. When we were, were at war uh, with Britain, you, you heard about George Washington in Fort Washington, not far, far from here, and the soldiers, uh, they had nothing to eat. They literally took their boots because they were leather, they were animal hide, and cooked them and ate their boots because that's all they had to eat. They would melt snow to drink that because that's all they had to drink. And they had to wrap cloths around their foot because they had no shoes because they ate them but they still managed to win the war. Forgive me, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> but it was amazing uh, uh, that it said we were unlike any other. Uh, when, when we finally won the war against King George of England, they said, wow, it, uh, George Washington was largely responsible for winning, helping us to win this. Uh, you know, we all pulled together, but he was an amazing man. And I've talked to you before about George Washington, how he was uh, seen in the woods after a battle and the men were sleeping for the night. He would go off into the woods and you see, remember that portrait with him kneeling by his white horse and he would cry out to God. And one time while he was praying, Indians came upon him and they listened to his prayer. And he said, how can they not win? when the man would cry out to his God as this man is crying out. George Washington would lead his men into battle and he has clothes with bullet holes through them, but he had never been shot. He's had like two horses shot out from underneath him, but he himself was never shot. That was the providence of God. That's the power of prayer. I don't care what obstacle you come against or are facing in life. Surely you're not facing the biggest empire of the world against you in this day. It might feel like it. But if you stand with God, you cannot be defeated. Amen. So what was John Adams talking about? Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. You see, our Constitution and our Bill of Rights establishes our rights. And everyone says, like, yes, I have rights. And people want to stop right there. I have the right to do this. I mean, I, 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 that, it's mine. You can't take it away from me. 
I, I, I was listening to this uh, pastor preach in, in, in his church in England. He said, those Americans, they're funny people. Now, I said, I got to give it to them. They'll get up right in the cop's face. I know my rights. I have the right to say my say. I have the right to speak out. I have the right to know why I'm being arrested. He said, we went through that in Britain. We just, okay, we'll sort this out. We'll sort this out later. <laughs> But he, he was making fun of us. But we have rights, and we know that. But it's come to a point where we think we have an entitlement. We have rights. But when our rights clash, I have the power to right to say anything I want to say. You don't have the right to say it in my house. Amen. <laughs> so when our rights clash, we write laws. That's what the laws are for, to distinguish, tell you where your rights end and the other person's begin. You have the right to swing your fist in the air as much as you want, and you have the right to come within a few inches of my face, but you don't have the right to make that connection. Because then you get a few lefts right back at you. <laughs> that was hot off the plate. That was directly from Lori. Uh, <laughs> yes, that supernatural download, yes. But the laws, the problem with laws, it's the lowest common denominator. It, it tells you how much you can get away with without getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like the, the speed limit sign. You know if you drive really fast and really recklessly, you can endanger yourself and others. So they said, look, if you go beyond this speed, you will be a danger to yourself and others. You could hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So we say, well, how fast can I? 55? Okay, let me... 57. Set the cruise control at 659. Okay, I should be good. See, the law only lets you get away with as much as you can get away with. So, initially, when we had a Congress, they would meet for a few days and they would all go back home for the majority of the year. But now we've got to the point because we've lost morality. We have to have laws for everything. Well, I, I, I can't go to the store and hold them up and, 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 and rob the bar or rob the, the grocery store. I know that's wrong. But if I hack into this computer account and transfer some money into my account, there was a time when there was no law against that. But it was immoral. You know it's wrong. And we talked just a few weeks ago about Jesus saying, you know, the Old Testament law says if you sleep with your neighbor's wife, you've committed adultery, you've committed a sin. But Jesus said, if you lust after her in your heart, and I said, that's your imagination. If you just imagine the sin, you're guilty of it. There's a spirit of the law. And that's what they argue in court. That's why they have court sessions. Because, you know, determining if they really broke the law and how badly did they break it. But you have to know sometimes you don't break the law per se, but you break the spirit of the law. Just because you stole from your neighbor and they don't know about it doesn't mean you didn't steal from them. If a tree falls in the woods, just because you weren't there doesn't mean it didn't fall. It still fell. So that's why law alone is not good enough. This is a nation of laws. Yes, it is. But John Adams said it should be more important that it is a nation of morals. And so, that's where I was going with George Washington and his troops. So they were starving, they were eating their boots, they were cold, they didn't have enough clothes, they didn't all have similar uniforms. They didn't have ammunition for their rifles. They had to depend on their bayonet at the end of their, their rifle musket. And the Continental Congress gets a donation. And they come together and decide, what should we do with this generous donation? And it was decided in the Continental Congress, we should distribute, we should purchase 10,000 Bibles and give it to our troops. How would you like that? During the COVID virus, Congress come together, we need a stimulus package. They say, hey, mm, how can we stimulate the people? I know. Let's call Nelson Publishers and have them produce 10 million Bibles, and we'll send it to every household in America. 
Yeah. Probably wouldn't fly as well as it did back in then, in those days. But the power of the word of God is so strong that you can stand on it. You can live by it. I was at a meeting the other day, uh, a pastor's breakfast, and these men showed up from Korea. And they were giving their testimony. One was giving his testimony. He said, the Lord uh, told me to be a missionary to New York. So he said he got his wife and his 10 kids. And the Lord told him not to take anything. I forget how much money he had when he came. It was $10 or whatever it was. Wife, pregnant, with 10 kids, came to New York, didn't have a place to stay, didn't have a plan. He just heard the Lord say, go to New York. I want you to be a missionary to New York. And he's telling the story. And he said, uh, we would go and we would witness all day and go in stores and tell people the love of Jesus. He said, it's New York. And, you know, all, the reception wasn't always the most pleasant. He said, it was summertime. It was very hot. He said, we did, we did have a van. So we would stay in the van. Ten people and a pregnant wife. He said, but because we didn't have anything to eat, he said, his wife began to get very sick. He said, you know, if you're pregnant, I've never been pregnant, but they say uh, the baby starts to consume uh, what the, the woman has, you know, consume her fat, her muscle, whatever nutrients she has. And so she's, she needs to feed not only herself, but her baby. And he was getting worried, and he would cry to God, and he said, pray to God, and said, God, I need this. I need that. I need food for my wife. I want to do what you said, but I need this. And then his wife got to be uh, sick. And he had a, I think he had a sick child as well. And they needed hospitalization. They needed some treatment. He said, God, I don't have any money to go to a doctor. I don't have money for food. I don't have a place to stay. And he said they would continue in the day and, work, and go out and minister. And his wife was getting sicker and sicker. And his child was getting sicker and sicker. And this lady came to him and said, I saw you come witness in my store. The Lord told me to give you my store. There's a back room. You can stay for as long as you need. Said, oh, no, 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 no. The Lord told me to trust him, to wait on him. What? <laughs> so she, she said, okay, well, at least take some food. So he took uh, some, well, what it was was he said, I was, he was praying for Korean barbecue and some, I forget what it was, miso soup or something. And this lady gave him Korean barbecue and some miso soup or whatever it was. And he's, wow. And he goes home and he's crying and praying to God, thank you for the soup and the food, but God, we need a place to stay. We need a place to stay. And God said, I'll, I'll take care of you. Do what I tell you to do. And again, the lady comes over again. I, I want to give you my store. You don't have a place to stay, do you? No, no, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And finally, she convinced him. And they all moved into the back of the store, nicely furnished beds and and all the food they could eat. It was a, a, a corner grocery store with an apartment behind, and they all stayed there. And then he, it clicked. Hey, God provided. Yeah. Sometimes God looks like you. Sometimes God looks like me. That's probably pretty rare. But God usually looks much better than that. But God can use you, but you have to be one that are not, although we are a nation, we are founded, given a bunch of rights, we are given these laws to help us stay within boundaries, but we must surrender our rights to God because God has given us a responsibility. Amen. With rights come responsibility. Our Constitution establishes our rights, but our rights clash with, when our rights clash with we have laws or we need laws, but laws reduce man to the lowest denominator. How much can I get away with without penalty? Well, yeah, I did that already. Jesus. 
So we all know in the Old Testament, Moses, he was the man. He was the man in the Old Testament because he got 10 laws directly from God. And you know what? I can just imagine the people trying to figure out how they can get around the laws, manipulate, stretch, read between the lines. So they would make other laws. God said, you can't work on the Sabbath. Well, if you walk more than three quarters of a mile, you're working. If you cook more than one meal, I don't know what it was. I, I, I'm making these up. I don't know. But they would, if you cook more than one meal, you're working. If you transport somebody else, you're working. You can't do that. So they make hundreds, I, I think there's like 400 and some other laws to help explain the 10 laws. But Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. He said, I'm boiling it down. I'm going to make it real simple. He said, yeah, 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 I want you to know your rights, but I want you to know that that should not be on the forefront of your mind. I have the right not to be stopped by the police. Well, maybe so. But God says you've got to love one another. And he says, I'm going to tell you how. Love one another the same way that God has loved you through me. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus Christ, his only son, to die for you. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. But what about Jesus' rights? He didn't do anything wrong. Even uh, Pontius Pilate said, I, I, I don't have any fault with the man. There's nothing he's done wrong. I don't see what the problem is. The law was there to protect him, and he, Jesus didn't open up his mouth. He didn't say a mumbling word. Can you imagine if for one instance, the right will stop saying to the left, you're wrong. What about if the left stops saying to the right, you're wrong. What if we just come together and say, what can I do to help you live a better life? What can I do to help you to be more comfortable? That's what a really America is. That's what the founding fathers saw. Yes, they want you to be aware that you have rights, but they want you also to curtail those rights with morality. Yes. Amen. Galatians 5.15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. What human beings bite one another? <laughs> Have you ever had anyone in your house bite someone else? They were probably under 10 years old. Yeah. That's stuff kids do. Yeah. He's saying, if we do this, we're acting like kids. We're talking, we're teaching in this church how to become the mature sons of God. Let's yeah. stop biting and tearing one another. He said, because you'll be consumed. We just have to turn on our TV just for a half an hour and see how the whole nation is biting and consuming one another. Yeah. The blacks are saying, black power, uh, black lives matter. We're going to burn down this neighborhood. Well, who suffers? When you bite and consume someone else, you yourself suffers. Amen. White supremacist groups doing their thing. Who suffers? I've said before, we've had revivals come to different regions. Movement of the Holy Ghost. It's like out of control. Then all of a sudden, someone, the leader of the, the movement, decides we, we need to make some rules. We're, we, we have to end services by 2 a.m. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Oh, uh, And we all can only allow the ordained people to minister around the altar. All right. And, 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 and when I'm not here, we can only have another man uh, govern in my place. We, we can't have a woman lead this thing. And they start putting these rules on it, and all of a sudden, the movement disappears. And they go, what happened? Oh, we're, what happened? So 
Sometimes we need to forget about the rules. We need to forget about our plans. We need to be able to surrender our rights. I'm not saying that we should be doormats. I'm not saying that we should wink at wrong. But what I'm saying is, don't be the one that's being the confronter or, or, or the initiator of wrong. You know, what disturbs me, and, and people get mad at me for saying this, do you know the fourth largest source of income of Philadelphians? The fourth largest source of income is suing somebody else. I've been with someone and said, oh, look at that sidewalk across the street. We should walk over there, because if we fall, hey, we can own that house. I'm like, dude, get away from me. Amen. Oh, you see that door handle on that bathroom, and they got water on the floor, and the soap dispenser right there? Man, I'm going to own this place. I already got my prepaid legal all paid up. I'm ready. I got them on speed dial. That's not the way it ought to be. That's not the way it ought to be. Now, those of you that are prepaid legal, don't give me any nasty looks or send me any emails. <laughs> you don't know my email address. I don't check it anyway. <laughs> but I'm saying people are looking to get the advantage over someone else. How can I use my rights to get something from you? And God said, that's not the mindset that we're to have. We're to love one another. We're to treat other people how we would want them to treat us. Amen. If someone were to trip and fall on my sidewalk, I would do everything I could to help them, but I wouldn't want them to sue me. So when I go to their house and trip and fall, I don't want to sue them. I know. I guess we'll have two less next Sunday. Anyway. That's childish behavior. Childish behavior. The, we want to be the mature sons. Psalm 133.3 says, Unity is where God commands the blessing. We cannot be united if we're constantly looking to get over on one another. The Founding Father says there's no way to legislate morality, so uh, they printed, purchased, and gave Bibles as reading materials when they started the public schools. Did you know that all seven of the Ivy League schools were founded to be schools to teach people the word of God, to teach and to train preachers? Do you know the, the big five in Philadelphia? They were all started to teach people the word of God. La Salle University, a Catholic university. St. Joseph's University, I don't even need to tell you. It starts with St. Temple University, come on. University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League institution was started to promote godly values in the people. The Continental Congress knew that people needed to know the word of God. And so they distributed, they taught people how to read by reading the word of God. The people in those days knew more scripture than the average Christian does today. The average tongue-talking Christian does today. All right, we've had enough. This is supposed to be an encouraging message telling you about the uniqueness of America. And see, this is another unique thing about America. If I, if Teresa and I were to move to Italy and we had children, our children wouldn't be Italians. If we moved to Japan and had children, our children wouldn't be Japanese. But if we stay in America, or if you come from Italy, or Spain, or China, or Mexico, or Guatemala, and come to the United States and have children, your children are American. It's a symbol. It's like the kingdom of God. God said you can come wherever you come from. Jesus. I'm calling all nations, tribes, and tongues. Come and be a part of the kingdom of God. Amen. That is the uniqueness of the United States of America. It is a symbol of the kingdom of God. I'm sorry if you don't like it. I said that to someone that got so mad at me. 
So now only one nation was established by God, and that was Israel. Yes, Israel was established by God, but so was the United States of America because we had people who dropped to their knees and they knew that the only thing that could cause them to be formed or come into their formation or become what God wants them to be is if they cried out to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin, after they had won their independence from England, I wish I had that quote before you. I didn't even think of it till just now. Uh, he said, because they began to look like they were falling apart. Now they were independent from England and they had other issues to deal with. They had debt from the Revolutionary War. They had, uh, you know, to make up some laws and then and to form a Supreme Court and all kinds of things were coming. And they were bickering and fighting one another. And, and Benjamin Franklin, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't remember his quote. He said, how could we expect to have defeated the British without the assistance of Almighty God, how can we also then expect to maintain this nation without the assistance of Almighty God? So I uh, declare that we should again address and consult Almighty God. Amen. Amen. If you got where you got because you cried out to God and he blessed you, don't you think you're going to need him the rest of your life? It amazes me. That people in, in desperate situations cry out to God and he heals them. He delivers them. He restores relationships. He sends in the finances. As soon as they're okay, they forgot God. I don't know why I can't get to these last three lines. And we're done. One, do what is just, not what you can justify. Do what your heart tells is just. Mm -hmm. What? You, you, you run home a whole case of paper from the office? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, everybody else does it. That, that's not stealing? No, no, no. I can justify it. I can say I work from home. <laughs> so God is saying, do what is just. What you know to be right. If you got God on the inside, red flags will pop up. Hey, yeah. hey, examine what you're doing. Think about this. Do you want to go down this road? Do you want to cut off my hand of blessings? I want to bless you, and I'm warning you. If you do this, you will slow up the blessings that I'm going to pour into your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let us be here, our, our, our ears tuned to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Yeah. So number one, do what is just, not what you can justify. Number two, do what is responsible, not what is permissible. Well, you know, my job, they don't even test you for marijuana. And in fact, they say it's okay to smoke a little weed on your, you know, 15 minute break. Well, okay, that may be permissible, but is that responsible? I used to work in a pharmacy at the hospital, University of Pennsylvania, and I would work under a hood, I would make up the IV bags for the patients throughout the hospital. I work do chemo bags, wow. <clears throat> TPNs, uh, so those people that couldn't eat, they would be fed intravenously. And just imagine if on my break I went out, you know, puff, puff, pass for 15 minutes, <laughs> come back in and say, hey man, everything is groovy. <laughs> everything coming together, oh, it don't matter. Put a little extra in them because I really like them. But yeah, matter of fact, give them twice as much chemo because I wanted them to do better. <laughs> Let's do what is responsible, not what is permissible. Number three, and I'm done. Do what is moral and not what is modeled. I want to be just like my boss. Yeah, he, he stepped on people, but look where he is now. He's a multi-trillionaire. And I'm going to do whatever he, he did. I'm going to use people. I'm going to sleep my way to the top if necessary. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do whatever, is, whatever this guy I, I like and I want to be like. Whatever he did, whatever he's modeling, whatever he's demonstrating in his life, I'm going to do what he did so I can get where he gets. And you know what? After he dies, you might not want to get where he gets. <laughs> I'm just saying. But we're to do what is moral not what is modeled. 
I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's your pastor. If you see your pastor doing something, uh, that's between him and God. That doesn't mean you can do it. This is an individual salvation. An individual salvation. When you stand before God, you can't say, God, I didn't pay my tithe because, well, I never saw the pastor pay his tithe. God, I, 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 you know, I don't know, whatever. But we have to do what we know is right. Just because you're, you can think you can justify it, just because you think it's permissible to other people. See, the world will define your Christianity. Don't let the world tell you what a Christian, Christian ought to be, because now I hear it all the time. Well, love is love. God is a God of love, isn't he? doesn't matter who you love, as long as you love them and use a condom. That was a sign downtown. City of brotherly love, but make sure you use a condom. I'm sorry, all you young people. <laughs> Prophylactic. Amen. We have a unique nation. God has blessed us. Often I go, I rehearse before God how blessed I am. Say, God, only 5% of the whole world's population lives in the United States of America. People from all over the world are pressing to get here. I've never heard anyone uh, try and beat down the borders of Italy and say, I just want to get into Italy. I want to have the Italian dream. No one is breaking down the borders of Cambodia, Colombia. Say, I, I just want to have the Colombian dream. The pot of gold. <laughs> He's, uh, I'm beginning to sound like Tyler Perry with everything reference to pop. But anyway, um, Sorry, can you edit that, please? <laughs> Time to wrap it up. Amen. This is the 4th of July. It's the day of independence. We live in the greatest. Uh, you, you're entitled to your own opinions, but I believe we're entitled, we live in the greatest country in the world. And I tell God, say, God, only 5% of the world lives in the United States, and I'm one of them. Yes. Wow. Yes. And if I think this is the greatest country, that means I live in a better country than 95% of the world. Wow. Wow. Amen. Wow. Of the seven and a half billion people on this earth, only about 4,000 claim to be Christian. I'm a Christian. Amen. Wow. So that must move me from 95 percentile to like the 97th percentile. Wow. Most of my friends don't have a mother and a father in the home their entire growing up years. I had a mother and a father, and both of them were saved Amen. my entire life. Wow, God, I am so amazingly blessed. Yes. That must move me into like 97 or 98 or 99 percentile. God, and not only all is all this going around me, not only my parents saved, not only do I live in America, but I have a personal relationship with you myself. I talk to you, and God, that's not so strange. A lot of people are hollering at you all the time, but God, you holler back yeah. to me. I hear your voice. You speak to me, the creator of the universe. God, I'm so privileged. And I want you to know, I don't know what's going on in your life. And I, I know some of you are going through some very difficult things, some emotional things, some financial things, some relationship things. I know that, but you don't ever forget that you are among the most blessed people on the planet. Yes. Yes. Stop yelling at God, God, I have the right to this and I have the right to that. I believe if we press into God and say, God, how can I bless you? I know, I know I have the right to be healed. It's the children's right. I know that. But God, I'm going to put that on the back burner. I know this sounds strange. But today, God, what can I do that blesses you? Today, I just want to please you. God, I, I know I need some more money. And, and my, my landlord says, if I'm late one more time, he's going to put me on the street. But God, what can I do for you? I know you 
said the gold and silver is yours, the cattle of a thousand hills are yours. I know you're my father, and you said you'll provide for me. And, and God, I'm going to stop begging and complaining about what I don't have or what I don't think you're doing enough of, but God, I just want to bless you today. Yeah. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. Praise the Lord. We live in a unique country. We have a unique thing going on. And, and not only are we in America, but God is moving us out of the, the church age into the kingdom age. We have uh, an ability to have an even greater relationship with God than the patriots did. The Bible says the patriots, the prophets of old, they long to live in this day. I believe that what Apostle Paul was talking about, he said he saw through a glass darkly, but one day we shall see him face to face. I know Apostle Paul didn't see clearly, but I believe that day is this. The kingdom age is here, and we, if we strive to press into God, we'll be able to see him clearly. We'll be able to know him even as we are known. We'll be able to hear his voice. Hallelujah. Keep pressing into God, for you haven't seen anything yet. Listen, this is the day of deliverance, and deliverance is taking the land. Yes. If you don't know God as your personal Savior, if you don't know Jesus Christ came to die for your sins, all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Say, God, I received the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for me. Uh, take me in as your son. Forgive me of all of my sins. You know what? Your eternal destination changed just that quick if you meant it in your heart. It's not the magic prayer, but it's by meaning it in your heart. But don't stop your prayer there. Ask God to fill you with his precious Holy Ghost with the gift of speaking in other tongues. Because speaking in tongues, I don't know how it works, but it speeds the process. It, it puts the afterburner on. For those of you that work on cars, it's, it's a nitrous oxide. You know, you hit the button and it accelerates you. That's what the Holy Ghost will do for you. It will seal you. Amen. You think I'm not moving fast enough in my Christian walk. Well, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. And hit that nitrous oxide button. And then take off. Yes, I did just walk fast and furious nine. But God's saying, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. And you can enjoy all these Thank benefits. You. Even if Thank you're not you. in America. You. you can have the freedom in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Shalom until the next time.